absolutely 100% thrilled and honored when the West, when the Bighorn Elementary from Wyoming said uh, yes, that they would do an open mic because, oh my gosh, um, didn't their parent newsletter just completely knock your socks off? Oh my gosh. Um, I read that newsletter and I thought, oh, if every child could be in a school like this and have teachers and administrators, because you know, we know those things don't happen without leadership too and support from um, lots of places, but oh my gosh, um, what a wonderful um, way to communicate with parents about how you teach reading and also then how we approach dyslexia. Oh my gosh, I was like running around like a, a little kid. So very excited. Uh, when I reached out to Crystal and she said, yeah, we'll do an open mic because I think it's so important that we learn from each other. You know, we're all in this together and um, how wonderful when we have great um, leaders who are, you know, trail, I said, you guys are trailblazers. Mm -hmm. um, we already have um, some of my friends in Pennsylvania have already um, started newsletters modeled after yours so i mean you're just starting a trend that's going to make such a big difference for teachers and kids so to the i'm telling you thank you so very very much for being here tonight it's it's such an honor to have you here um i don't know who wants to start first but i'm going to stop talking because we they want to hear from you okay well, i want to just say thank you for having us i mean we're flattered that people want to hear our story and we're also just excited just because uh we gotta we gotta spread we gotta spread the word and get kids reading get out of this crisis so thank you so chris yeah Oops. do we just tell people who you are crystal and maybe then the team can introduce themselves yeah yeah so i'm crystal lenhart and i'm the reading specialist here at bighorn elementary and just super blessed to have this team of educators that works with me and has studied right along with me and embraced everything that we're doing and and Kathy, our principal, who was just on, that was Kathy Powers, our principal, and really none of this would have taken place if we would have had the principal shutting us down. And instead, she was embracing everything and encouraging us to move forward. So, I mean, that was a huge key in, in being able to really transform this school in a matter of months, really. Um, yeah, so... I think we have what five or six of our team here. I can't see everyone, but if you're one of our Bighorn team members, why don't you speak up? I know we've got kindergarten, first grade. We have one of our um, valuable paraprofessionals here. Um, so go ahead, guys. Just on, just on mute. Okay, hi, I'm, I'm Carolyn Martinez and I teach kindergarten at Bighorn. I'm Caroline Houck and I teach first grade. And we are just so thankful that we have Kathy, that we have Crystal leading the way. Um, and yeah, I'll just, I'll let everybody else introduce themselves. Um, I'm Leanne Boggs and I'm uh, just a para that helps the teachers oh, with reading and just. have reading oh, just, just, just don't say just. No, no, not just. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm I'm a privilege to be a para there. So and they're privileged to have you, I think exactly. there. So. Thank you. <laughs> and she's a parent and she's she wears many hats during the day. <laughs> sorry, yeah. I didn't mean the just part. <laughs> Uh, I'm Caitlin Swing, and I'm the Kinder Boost teacher at Bighorn Elementary. Okay, I'm Gabby Hafes. I am a fourth grade teacher at Bighorn Elementary. Did we ever get Jenna in? Um, I think she's on mute, but she doesn't know that. Sorry, oh. sorry, Jenna, just on mute. I was on mute. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Jenna Butler and I teach kindergarten as well. And then do we have, is Heather here? Heather Fleming? I am. Hello. Hey, Heather. She's part of our team too. Yeah. <laughs> You miss anybody? I think we're good. Crystal, do you? I, I had also made you co-host. Do you want to start, or anyone can start? It doesn't matter. Whatever you're most comfortable with. 
Um, yeah, gosh. So I guess we start with kind of how we how we got to this place. Myself as a reading specialist, I started in with digging into research um, around dyslexia. And then I also went to a, an OG training and um, it was kind of like a perfect storm in that then Emily Hanford's podcast came out and that kind of all happened at the same time. And um, beyond that, then I just, I mean, it clicked right away for me that I think I had always been leaning towards that, but we were a year ago, we were um, an F and P school. We had, you know, used the benchmark in the fall um, along with Ames Web, we would do both. And um, I think we were just seeing that our data kind of was stuck in that same range um, that now we see lines up pretty much exactly with uh, the ladder of reading that we see um, from Nancy Young so much. Um, so we were kind of, you know, for a school that really we have so much going for ourselves, you know, our data was just kind of, yeah. And so um, for me, that um, just digging into what we need to do for kids with dyslexia and um, along with, you know, the message that was really getting out there from Emily Hanford, uh, that started the ball rolling. And then once you start researching, there's no end to, <laughs> to confirming the things that you see. And, you know, so um, then to sort of add to our, our perfect storm scenario, it was uh, last year was a year that we um, on the rotation could adopt new language arts curriculum. So as we were learning all of this, it came at the time that we were able to um, adopt curriculum. So that also um, became part of it. And so we have started this new school year as a really a completely immersed in the science of reading school, as opposed to last year starting out as a F and P school. And um, just, it's so thankful that everyone kind of came on board. Everyone was able to um, really just see the see the research behind everything that we wanted to do, and and we all embrace that and are moving forward. So, you know, I don't know if some of our team, you guys, want to share kind of what that was like as we began to go. Wait a minute. Maybe what we've been doing for years, we could do better. I think it really hit home for our K-1, like in our PLC. I mean, I remember the first time that we read the article and I was in complete denial. I just remember reading it and being like, what? What we've been doing is wrong. And, but then you just start to think about it. And we just, I just remember like, we all read the article, but we didn't really do much about it. And we just kind of let it sink in and stew. And then I just remember looking at some of the books when we would have reading groups and, you know, you're asking this kindergartner who doesn't know how to read to look at the word airplane and it says, you know, I see an airplane and, you know, what could they possibly sound out? How could they possibly know what that word is? But what did we do? We'd say, oh, look at the picture. Look at the first sound. Does that sound right? Does that look right? And, you know, all of a sudden, I think things just started to click. And, you know, we, I think we also have always in K1, you know, we really started building in our phonemic awareness. We really started, you know, we had a good phonics base for what we did during guided reading, but it was still guided reading. And so I always say it's like the stages of grief. You know, we, it was denial, then there was anger. And finally we, you know, we accepted it and we're like, okay, how do we move on? Um, so I don't know, at least that's how it was for me. Carolyn, can I ask you real quick, when you say you read the article, I'm sure everyone's wondering like, what article did you read? <laughs> uh, the, gosh, what was it? The words? And the hard words, words. Hard words. Yes. yes. Emily, Emily Hanford's. Yep. Yep. It was, I remember a friend of mine actually from Pennsylvania. She's a teacher friend. 
Um, and she sent it to me and, you know, cause we're, we both teach balanced literacy. And I just remember thinking, oh, this is bull. Are you serious? Like I didn't, you know, I didn't want to believe or accept it at all. Um, but then you just kind of, we kept going back to it and I kept thinking about it and thinking, well, what if it's not? And what if what, and now I think we all think of those kids that we had four or five, six years ago, that would be so much better so much better readers if we did, you know, if we did now, if we did it then for them. And so that's the hard part, I think, right now, but we'll, we'll let that go and just keep moving forward. Mom. Yeah, I'm going to mute. <laughs> um, so do uh, anyone else jump in from uh, Bighorn? Or if you have questions for uh, where we are already, please unmute and ask. That's why we're here to learn. Well, I guess I would like to just add on um, kind of to where Caroline left off. And I wanna start by saying, um, just like Caroline did that, um, I am just so thankful. We are so blessed to have that K-1 data team that we do have. And um, it's been two years of, of that team, that group of women, we've become really close. And, and looking at data and asking ourselves like, okay, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're working really hard. <laughs> Our kids are really, really bright kids. Why, you know, we are putting every intervention in place that we know to put into place. You know, why aren't these scores increasing? And, you know, we are in Wyoming and we could tell ourselves that, hey, you know, we're a little bit higher than everyone else is right now, but that, that wasn't making us feel better. You know, the reality was, you know, six out of 10, of our kids were proficient, but that also meant that four out of 10 of our kids were not. And we, we didn't want to accept that. We were not going to accept that because, you know, we knew that we could get that 95% of our kids could be skilled readers. And so um, I think that really that really was the driving force for me, at least, is, hey, we, we have to do better. And if we don't know a way, then we're going to find it. <laughs> you know, we, we were not going to give up. And so um, adding on to that, like Crystal said, it really was a perfect storm for us. We had, we had a lot of things just hitting us at one time. And, and some of it was completely out of our control and some of it was in our control, but um, it really opened that door uh, for opportunity, you know, and we were just so thankful that um, we had access to research that that we needed and, and it came at the perfect time. And we were able to dig into that research together as a team, we were able to learn, we were able to grow. And then, you know, mid, mid year last year, um, we're like, we gotta have decodables. We gotta have them, we gotta have them right now. <laughs> you know, and, and we had that, that phonics foundation. It was like, we really need to apply this in our decodables. We need to get kids reading good, text so that they could become these skilled readers. And so I think, I think that, and then more research, just, um, just, we took it to heart and that led us to um, the reading rope, which then led us to, for K3 at least, Amplify and to 4.5, it led them to wit and wisdom. So I'll let them talk more about that. But it was just kind of a heart-wrenching journey for us. Every, every Wednesday, it felt like we were just in the battlefield figuring out what we could do next. And one of the things that we would see was that um, if we were using Fountas and Pinnell's benchmark assessment system, we had so many kids that were reading above grade level, but our Ames Web oral reading fluency data didn't really match up with that and neither did our state assessment. So it's like these kids were trained pretty well to get through those types of leveled texts, um, but the reality of what their reading skills really, really are was 
was not really what FNP will demonstrate that they are. So I feel like that's kind of something to be aware of. You can feel like you're doing pretty good basing yourself off of what levels um, that these kids are reading at, but I don't believe that's an accurate picture really. Um, there's a question in the question, uh, the chat box from Linda. Uh, what trainings did your teachers feel helped them with this transformation? So can you talk a little bit about the training that you had, you know, cause it's a big transformation pretty quickly and then uh, what's in the future? Well, I think one of the things that, oh. no, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say, one of the things too that I think really helped us wrap our heads around like the decodables and the phonics was that the year before, I think it was, was it three years ago when we did the Blevins book study, the K3 did like a, the Blevins phonics. I'm trying to think of which one it was. Um, but, you know, we all started doing blend lines with our kids. We all start, you know, we really, I, I you know, I think, I know at least K2, um, you know, we, that was something that I think helped a lot of us. And I know we still, especially for our reading groups. I mean, Blevins is a great um, resource, at least for me and what I go, he's one of the, one of my go-tos. Yeah, and I, I think- didn't, We didn't really have any, for, we haven't had, Mom. have we had formal, we I mean, we're getting letters really, training, which is amazing. Um, yeah, we, what we would do, one thing that was successful is that when, I had an article to share or something like that, we would not hand it out for people to read independently. Instead, we would hand it out at a staff meeting and take the time right then and there so that everyone actually did read it and discuss it because kind of passing stuff out. I know when I was in the regular classroom, you are overwhelmed with stuff and articles that are handed out typically kind of get buried in your desk. So that was one thing that was meaningful is that we took the time on the, the things that were really kind of crucial to understand. And we would go through those like research and articles um, as a staff at the same time, making sure that we were all kind of processing it together. Um, reading Amplify's primers one and two together as a staff was helpful. And there was a really quite a few different articles. Um, I guess one other PD was um, that we all got David Kilpatrick's Equipped for Reading Success. And I did, I think it was like a half a day kind of PD on that. Um, again, kind of making sure that we all went through that. So, but as far as really formal, PD that is yet to come. And because of our partnership with Wylit and Heather Fleming, who's on here, um, our entire staff, including paraprofessionals, um, we're, we will, I am a letters trainer, but our whole staff will, um, will, we're starting in December so that we can get our whole staff trained in letters. Um, and we've done so much just kind of on our own ahead of that, that we're going to have some really good background knowledge for that, but um, our formal training is really just coming. We really are um, just kind of blazing the trail right now, but somehow we were able to just dive in with both feet and uh, we're just doing everything, everything that we can find that we need to be doing, we're just able to implement it <laughs> because we have awesome leadership that will let, that, you know, makes that possible. We just take a moment maybe to talk to Kathy. Can we talk to you about leadership? Because that's one thing we see over and over again that um, oftentimes you have these really go-getter teachers who learn about the science of reading and they're on fire, but they're in systems where leadership maybe is not on the same page. And so what we've seen over and over again is how important leadership is. So would you mind talking about it from the leadership point of view? And then there are some questions in the chat that I'm gonna bring up if that's okay. But I think it's really important to hear from you. Thank you. Absolutely. So. Um, first of all, Crystal, we coined her our podcast lady because she just was listening to podcasts every every time that she had, and we're just so blessed that she's led us along this way. So, for first of all, for administrators, I mean, give me a call. Let me let me just have a personal conversation because 
how could how could how could I ignore something so powerful as this? Um, for years and years, Amesweb, ORF, every year we rise and then we dip. We rise and we dip. Three, four, five. There we call them our on watch kids. And what's what's going on? Like we have solid PLCs. We we analyze the data. We make adjustments. We just were making the wrong adjustments and not knowing that we were making the wrong adjustments. Um, this this BHE team, they are just solid, dedicated educators. We we um, we 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 work hard at doing all the right things that kids need. And um, when Crystal brought this up, first it started, and everybody has a different spin on it, but the progression that I recall was the Emily Hampert. And yes, like kind of like Caroline had said, and the stages of grief and all that. Then it was the primer one and two, and it just kept going. We read the knowledge book or the knowledge gap. That was, and that it wasn't a book study. It was just whoever wanted to. People joined the Facebook page and it just, it just starts. And one thing I would tell the administrators is also staff meetings should not be like a housekeeping. It should be spent with professional development because we just don't get enough time of that. And that's in fact, we just had last week. Who'd we have last week? It's still in progression. Um, Dr. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Fletcher, you're the patent that uh, his, yes, we watched that. We oh, watched half amazing. of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I hope you use the facilitation guide that we created too. <laughs> oh, so we haven't got to that yet, but that, <laughs> that we did. I Yeah, those from your patent literacy symposium, there's just an endless supply of awesome PD and yeah. Thank you for saying that. There are some questions in the chat box and anyone can jump in and Heather, we haven't heard from you yet too, but let me just, I'll toss some out that are in the chat here. Um, from Jan Hasbrook, we're so honored to have you here, Jan. Um, mm -hmm. Aside from Emily's work and Scarborough's rope, were there other pieces of information that gave you that important aha? And I think you've mentioned some of them, but any others you wanna bring up at this point? The primers you brought up. Um, um, I mean, there's just it's so much for me. Um, you know, I I really was slash am the podcast lady. <laughs> That's what I I listen every morning as I put on my mascara and uh, as I'm driving. You know, I just. Um, there's just such a wealth of information. There's been such quality um, symposiums online, really. And even our own state, thanks to Heather Fleming, we hosted an amazing literacy symposium this summer that was just available to us. Um, so we have taken advantage of that. We actually were so excited about just getting started that we were going to go to the Wasatch literacy symposium I don't I can't remember what it was called in Utah that's when everyone was kind of like yes let's go we were literally going to fly a group of us down there and go and that's when COVID hit and shut everything down so um then I think we learned how to access all that stuff online um but as far as you know that reading rope model has been huge and just the simple view that is coming up has come up in conversations with parents trying to explain exactly what's going on with their kid um but i'm just looking forward to getting diving deep into the letters training and talking more about that four-part processor and which we haven't really got to much yet next question was what state assessment do you use in wyoming is i'm assuming it's a a state assessment, but is there anything that you want to tell us about your state assessment? Well, the Pam, state can you assessment check the is waiting easy. room? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, just uh, that question about the state assessment. Is there anything you want to elaborate on that? Uh, state assessment, we call it YTOP, but it's a smarter balance. It's That's what it is. Um, I don't know if there's anything to elaborate on it. No. Pam, yeah, can I ask a question? Because that was my question. Okay. Yeah. What specifically are you? Thinking? So if so, I'm in Washington State. So we use the Smarter Balance 
are the tests the same? Are they customized for each state? I just don't know that level of detail. I think they're a little customized, but like when we look at our samples on YTOP, mm -hmm. they're the same as a Smarter Balance. So I don't know. I'm sure they take some tweaks here and there. I don't know. I'm not quite the guru on that, but okay. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, question for Kathy. Um, how did you approach Kathy? How did you get her on board? And <laughs> Kathy, what's your advice to get other principals on board? <laughs> you want to I, well, I think... Her? I think um, Kathy is a part of our data teams. And so, I mean, she's just part of our team. So we all kind of experienced that at, together. And so, um, I mean, I would say, when did the, I don't know. It, she would have to kind of, she's kind of explained her, her um, path to that, but, um, I think she was just very open to, we, we want to find solutions. I remember this was another thing. We watched a reading league video. It was uh, Maria Murray talking about fluency. That was a big aha. I remember that, wait a minute, because this has been an ongoing, you know, our Ames web data for, or kind of not that great really. It's like, why? Well, let's get to the word recognition level and let's apply the science. And I think that, I think that clicked a lot in Kathy's mind. I'm speaking for her now, yeah, but yeah, no, that was it. It was the fluency. It's just been a battle every time and saying, well, why do we need to even understand, you know, proficiencies and fluency and, oh, because it frees up the brain. How simplistic, you know, is that? And Okay, and it just really when you break it down to simplicity, it just makes such logical sense. Um, I just that's that part that's just hard to deny. Yeah, it's very hard on fluency in in this meeting, <laughs> so I What's don't that? know if you want to jump in there, but seriously, um, she's the world's leading expert in fluency. So <laughs> I'm sure that's music to her ears, but I don't know if you want to add anything, Jan. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, yes, it is music to my ears for sure because ORF is widely used now. It took it took about 20 years for it to be discovered, and now it's widely used. But it's widely misunderstood too that people are using it and principals and reading specialists and teachers and parents just like why should my kids be reading faster and faster this can't be the right assessment and um, so the fact that you get it that it is I always talk about it as the thermometer that tells us whether our kids are on track or not it doesn't tell us everything by any means but um, that's that is music to my ears you're <laughs> absolutely right Pam because it's such an elegant little tool. It takes so little time, time being one of the most precious things we have in classrooms. If uh, more people, and sort of that's one of my missions is helping people understand how valuable that tool is if, if we understand what it really tells us. Well, bless you all. I'm here to just uh, cheer you on and um, take your what you've learned and share it with other people because this is, think of all the kids, think of all the kids you are touching in a profoundly new way. So Thank that's, you. that's my two cents. It's awesome. <laughs> what an honor, huh? Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's, oh my gosh. Um, Kathy, just another question that came up uh, because you are a building administration, but we know also that central administration and district leadership can play a role um, either in removing barriers or maybe perhaps um, not removing barriers. Um, could you talk just a little bit about district leadership? Um, and then there, there's lots of questions and I'm gonna just keep them coming, sorry. Okay, okay. So um, really, you know, we're a small district and it really was just me calling up the superintendent and explaining what we're on and, and kind of to concisely put it, it's, I don't really care how you get there, just get there. <laughs> and so we're, we're getting there, so that's, that's the concise way. So he's very, he's supportive and, and uh, learning a little bit as we keep giving him information. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just, it, I, we just got the go ahead. So. Awesome. Oh, um, questions about assessments. Um, you mentioned prior, I'm not sure if you're still doing FNP, like leveling kids. Um, and I see Crystal. No. Yeah. 
<laughs> but what are you, what kind of assessments are you using now? And we haven't really had a chance to kind of hear a little bit of a background about the school, um, like demographics or size. And would you mind just sharing some of that too? Thank you. Yeah. I'm trying to let some people in the, <laughs> the there's okay. some people waiting in the room, uh, waiting to get in, I think. Go okay. ahead and let them in. So we are um, a school of about 232 kids. Um, that's not including our pre-K. So we have a pre-K session that's about 25 and we have a kinder boost. Kinder boost is um, if you're not quite ready for kinder, socially, emotionally, or academically, then you can choose the option of kinder boost. And we have two, two sections per grade level. Um, we are a um, K-12 campus in the sense that we're, I say we're in the shape of a lucky horseshoe. And we have the middle school and the high school right across the parking lot. Um, so before, anyway, before COVID, we would have a lot of partnerships with them. Um, our free and reduced is pretty minimal. We're blessed. Um, and that's part of, and Heather, if you want to jump in too, because that's part of the comparison as well. But I, our percentage, um, oh, I don't know this year, I think last year, 18%, something like that. Pretty small. And um, we live in a town where we're kind of spread out. So here's an important piece. Um, 40, no, 35% of our students are out of district. So they choose to be here. And there's a lot of students that um, want to be here that can't be here because of our, um, our size. So that's kind of that in a nutshell. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Heather, do you want to share a little bit about why Lit and your um, interactions and what you're doing in Wyoming? It's very exciting. So would you mind popping in? Of course, of course. So first of all, this is about Bighorn. I'm so proud of these women. It makes my eyes leak a little bit. Um, I am the mother of a, of a dyslexic student who's now 15. And you know, after uh, we moved, when he was diagnosed, we moved to Colorado for two years for him to attend a school for uh, dyslexic students. Um, during that time, I did substantial training in the science of reading and evidence-based instruction um, and came back to Wyoming and just decided that I couldn't constitutionally tolerate um, families kind of going through what we went through. And we were lucky. We had the resources to move and, and have him remediated. And I had, you know, I quit my job and became a reading specialist, right? So this is this was lucky. So um, so the first thing my partner and I did was write a K rewrite a K-3 reading law in Wyoming, um, which had the impact of, of so Bighorn was already doing this, but had the impact of having schools really have to start to consider um, what kind of instruction and assessment they were using. Um, our mission is to raise funds for teacher training in evidence-based instruction. And so the project that we're really excited to be working on with Bighorn right now is one where um, just last week, we got word that a funder agreed to a $38,000 grant for, for Bighorn. So it will, it's uh, letters train all their teachers. It will um, early letters train the teachers who need it. And we are, um, they're also going to implement um, Amy Murdoch's Mount St. Joseph uh, Project Ready Preschool Program. I'm currently doing my master's under Amy, under Dr. Murdoch. Um, so, so, th so that they, you know, and, and the goal again is for, for the school to have, you know, kind of pre-K through fifth grade um, data that shows the impact of, um, you know, changing your instruction. Um, so again, like I just, I am in awe of what these women have accomplished. Um, part of what Kathy was mentioning is that um, as part of this pilot, we chose two schools. So we chose Bighorn and we also chose a school uh, on the reservation called Wyoming Indian Elementary, um, who, who is also doing letters training and who is very committed to the same kind of change. Um, that school is um, serves 100% Native American students, 100% free and reduced lunch. And so what we wanted to show is that, you know, very low free and reduced lunch, 100% free and reduced lunch, that proportionally you can raise the scores of these students, obviously, um, the school on the reservation, you know, these children are touched by everything that can impact literacy and it's very complicated. And we recognize that and that's, you know, it sort of their training has some different aspects to it because of that. Um, but that was the kind of comparison that, that Kathy's mentioning. So we're just, we are proud to be affiliated with a school and teachers like this who are doing this work because it will, it will save children. I think they're proud to be affiliated with Wylet, Heather. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so uh, questions in the chat box, lots of them. Um, one was about report cards. Um, did the report cards need to change? Uh, and if they did, how did you do that? And also a uh, question about um, how do you know if kids are on grade level? How are, so 
two questions basically around assessment and reporting us uh, out. Uh, you going, Kathy? <laughs> well, why don't you hit the assessments first? Right. Oh, is, that okay. the, is that the second or? Yeah. What was what was the question again about the assessments? Okay, I didn't hear. Uh, um, it was what assessments are you using now, right? We know you're probably oh, not. Oh, how do we know they're on grade how level? How do you know they're on grade level? And because of the assessments um, and what you're reporting out to parents, did your yeah. did your report card change and yeah. how so? Okay. Um, so we are relying quite, quite a bit on our uh, foundational skills data, such like we're measuring in AmesWeb. Um, to track if they're at, at their grade level, really. If they are meeting those benchmarks, um, you know, if they are meeting the kindergarten benchmarks all the way through, really, that that's showing us um, a good indication of where they are in reading. Um, with adopting the curriculum that has some curriculum, you know, some assessments with that, that is really giving all of our kids that access to, to their grade level material. And that's one of the beautiful things that we love about adopting this high quality instructional materials is that every kid and our struggling readers are participating in ways that they never have before with access to their, to their grade level of text. Um, so I would say those assessments um, and, and whether they are reading at their expected benchmark level um, and then, yes, it's, it is a challenge of how we're sort of adjusting our reporting system. We are standards-based reporting, um, and, you know, we have some with our, we only have one other, um, elementary school in our district, and so we need to have common assessments. At this point, we're sort of not exactly on the same page, but I believe we will be, you know, kind of coming together on that um, soon. And it's gonna take some adjusting of our assessments. Um, Crystal, since you're still talking assessments, another question came in, um, what diagnostics, so when, you, you know, you have students who appear to be at risk from your universal screening and other data, what diagnostics do you follow up with to uh, determine like specific needs? For we're, using, we're using the letters um, phonics survey and spelling survey. Um, and then we're also going in with the past of phon phonologic, phonemic awareness. We did um, Hegarty, but it, we're kind of finding that we, I think we want the more specific information from the past because we use Kilpatrick's, <clears throat> um, that program in our small reading groups to really track where each kid is at in their phonemic awareness. So, um, we find Higgerty's useful whole group, but to really zero in on each kid, we're liking using um, David Kilpatrick's, those one minute exercises. Um, does that answer your question? Did, did we hit that? <laughs> it does, yeah. And I think, do I think we talk report cards yet? Yeah, report cards are sort of complex with, since we are fitting this into a, an existing system. Go ahead. Kat. And yeah, so for the report cards, like Crystal said, we're standards reference and it's, um, so we have it with the, um, we call them outcomes and that's the standard and then the components, the targets. And so it's, it's, it's a process. So what we did, um, because we're the, the two programs that we use, Wit and Wisdom for the fourth and fifth, and then for the K3, the Amplify, um, with those programs, they spiral. And so, we know that there needs to be time passing before we can really um, know for sure where they're at on the standards. So we're, we're reporting out on the targets, on the, on the component pieces. And um, we haven't changed it yet. And like Crystal was, was saying, yes, we, we know that it's, we're going to have to um, get it aligned here pretty soon, but we gotta go through a year because we don't know what we don't know. We got to go through the process of this year still. So did that answer the question? Yes, I think so. Okay. Um, well, what, what got this all started was that newsletter. <laughs> I have to say yeah. uh, that newsletter, honestly, 
It rocked my world. I think it rocked a lot of other people's worlds as well. I mean, it almost brought me to tears and almost brings me to tears to talk about it, honestly. But not only did you say um, how we're teaching reading, and this is the science of reading, but also for the first time in a newsletter, I saw what you wouldn't be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, that was like a revelation uh, because you, you know it's a big shift, right? And so you, you were just so uh, clear, concise, but also like, here's what we're doing. And here's what we're not doing anymore. So these are some changes that you might see, might see. So first of all, um, how how did this happen? <laughs> this amazing thing happen? Uh, how did your parents respond to it? And then you also have how we approach dyslexia, Bighorn. So you know we only have like 19 minutes left. So I really do want to hear about this newsletter because it's it is spawning um, replication across you know, the world, I hope. Um, so how did it come to be? And what was the response? Crystal happened. Well, <laughs> you know, it came to be on an afternoon in the summer. <laughs> as I began to really think about, you know, we are really going forward, we are actually going to do all of these things. And this is, um, it's going to be a big change. And we have parents that um, have known a certain way. And especially, I mean, we would, we would have parents that they were also comparing, you know, that those FMP levels, um, you know, what level is my kid on or even putting it out there on Facebook or, you know, my kid's this level. And, you know, and I just knew that it was going to, for some people be like, wait, what, what are you guys doing? And so um, I just tried to sat down and just tried to, from a parent's perspective, as concisely as I could explain exactly what we were doing and why, and try to make it just, um, you know, there's a reason there's, there is research behind this. And um, just felt like we really needed to kind of lay the whole thing out and make it clear. So I, you know, I, maybe you get some of you of, of our team can kind of talk about what the response has been. I, I would like to jump in just because, um, just to give a shout out too to the rest of the staff, we sent that newsletter home, um, but we didn't stop there. So also teachers took it upon themselves at the beginning of the school year to make sure to have reading nights um, for our parents. We opened our doors even at the beginning of the year with all COVID going on and, and invited parents in. And we wanted to first reassure our parents that you know reading is going to happen this year at Bighorn Elementary and we're going to do everything in our power um, for it to happen the way we want to and then on top of that you know we wanted to reassure our parents are very involved they're very active and and we just we just thank them for that a million times over and those involved parents we needed them to know hey things are going to look different and and this is why and this is the research behind it and I think it began with Crystal's newsletter and, and I think this year has been so successful because of letting them know what wasn't going to happen anymore. You know, you guys say that's kind of revolutionary, but our parents needed to know that it was going to look very different for a reason. So. I think we've had, we've had comments from parents. Um, saying they really, they are really liking the changes that they see. I mean, we have not had, I know I'm not aware of any pushback from parents whatsoever. I think we've had all positive, really, haven't we? Has there been anything? I know for in my, for first grade, I have a lot of uh, siblings that are in third, fourth and fifth grade. And so, you know, these parents have seen over the years how we've taught reading. And so obviously this year was a big change. And they're just super excited about it and have, you know, it's very bit, it's been super positive. And they're even saying, you know, there are some hard, some hard habits to break for the third, the fourth, the fifth graders, you know, I mean, they're, they've been doing it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the balanced literacy approach yes. for a long time. So um, there's, there's some hard habits 
that we're breaking, but it is working. And, but yeah, no, I've, I heard wonderful things at parent teacher conferences. Um, there was a question about your curriculum um, as to why you chose um, one for like the earlier grades and a different one for later grades. So just a quick question about that. And then I have another one to follow up. Who wants to answer? <laughs> Who wants to answer? It's, it's a little unorthodox to do the split like oh. that, right? I mean, that, and when we kind of arrived, when the teachers arrived to, that was their gut feeling we needed to do that. I was like, oh my gosh, I hope, oh, okay. Um, but it's the K-3 with foundation. And why, why, why was three um, in that foundational piece? Because we needed to go back and just hit the foundation. Um, four or five, it's the content mostly. And that's basically in, in the nutshell. We all thought we were going one way and then we had a you know, presentation and research and we're like, oh, well, let's, that's how we ended up. And we're very pleased with it. Okay, here's a great question. There's a couple really, all good questions. Um, curious, uh, a question about, um, to the teachers of Bighorn, um, what do you think made Crystal so effective? Uh, because we want, we want to replicate Crystal and all of you. <laughs> So um, what made Crystal effective? Because, you know, um, she's been a catalyst here, but what, what made her effective? What made you kind of jump on board? Crystal just has a way about her. I, um, her I've been teaching with her. I, well, we've been at Bighorn the same. We started 10 years ago and she's had a lot of different hats, but um, I think she has a lot of quiet grace. I think that she, you, when she, when she talks, you listen. And, um, you know, she's not overly, she's not in your face about things, but she's just, this is the research. This is, you know, let's try it. And, um, you know, she's just one of those quiet leaders that you just want to follow. Thank you, Caroline. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to add something. She, Crystal is amazing. She started teaching my son five years ago and she's an amazing teacher. And just, I have a struggling second grader reader and Crystal's been working with her. So this program, just watching my daughter decode and learning to do that and watching her grow, um, it is amazing and crystal has a just a huge heart and you can just see in her how much she wants to help these kids thank you and i i think with with leanne's daughter these are the kids that now we can feel so much better that she's getting what she needs now she's not going to be one in fourth or fifth grade that we're going oh wish we would have known this and and I'm you know I just I do see her growing so much and mm -hmm. and feeling like we are empowered now to give those kids that need some help what they need it's just makes such a difference when we had every intention before but now we've got some evidence to back up what we can really do to help these kids so so question about small group instruction what does that look like um, in the school well, okay, so this is another piece of our success is that we have this awesome structure in place that is left over from guided reading of a sort of a flood in um, model where we can break into <clears throat> every grade level has got a, a half an hour time slot um, where we flood in and have, you know, both have four um, classroom teachers, we have paras. So we have like six or eight groups to service, what, at the most 40 kids. So <clears throat> we have that structure in place that works beautifully. Um, so our small groups um, are based on a variety of things. It used to be based on just their F&P level, but now they're based on a lot of different things. Um, sometimes we're going to zero in on which kids need the phonemic awareness piece or which font, <clears throat> excuse me, phonics level <clears throat> that they're at. And um, 
so we spend a lot of time thinking about differentiating for those groups. We put a lot into that. <clears throat> Just now, that's admit, where we're. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'll jump in as a fourth grade teacher um, and using wit and wisdom. Wit and wisdom has volume of reading for each module. So um, books, I mean, great texts that are focused on a certain topic, a certain theme. So our small groups, we've been able to almost have like novel studies for some of those kids. But then because Crystal and um, everyone who's been helping, we assess them right at the beginning of the year. We marked those fourth and fifth graders who need backfill. They need to be working with Crystal in those small groups. And um, in fourth grade, we actually had a large group of kids who needed that work. And so both Leanne and Crystal, they took a group. How many did you guys have? Like 10 kids? That one? Yeah. And um, they were both in there working on instruction. And then we were, we were able to separate them and we're kind of, it's called walk to reading. So they're changing, they're evolving. The kids are going to different places and it's been awesome. And also the kids are enjoying it. I think that they're almost grateful to not be in an R group anymore and trying to strive to get to that next letter. They're enjoying it. So um, that's what it looks like in fourth and fifth grade. Thank you. How about uh, K12 teachers or, or three want to share what does small group instruction look like in your grade levels? I think for the most part, we follow a phonics continuum. <laughs> and then we've also kind of created our own progress monitoring to see, okay, are you know, how are they doing on CVC? Are we ready to move on from CVC? What's next? And, you know, we kind of follow um, a progression like that. We've also kind of come up with our, um, our own lesson plan for our small groups. What are our no. non-negotiables? No. You know, we do um, no. Kilpatrick one minute drills. We do a little bit of, um, you know, word work. We, you know, obviously we do blend lines and chaining and um, really focus on, you know, what that skill is. And then we're reading those, that decodable, you know, we're, we're having them read, you know, for working on blends, then that's, that's the text that they're getting into. Um, sorry, my two-year-old is <laughs> a two-year-old. <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> I don't know. I know Jenna and Kayla can jump in and kind of talk more about um, with kindergarten as well, but it's, I, you know, I think it's, it's working really well. It's really a slick. Um, that's one thing that that maybe you could share also, Crystal, is your lesson plan, because it just has everything so nicely laid out as to what we should be doing. I just yeah. So I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jenna. Well, I just wanted to add on for the kindergarten portion. Um, one thing that was different this year I wanted to share with everybody was that we started our kindergarten groups based on that past assessment. And, and we gave them that, that strong foundation in phonological and phonemic awareness before we even began um, that lesson plan that Caroline was talking about. So that's one thing that was very different this year. And one thing that's been really successful for our kindergartners. Sorry, Crystal, go ahead. No, no. Um... Oh, Caroline was referring to um, a lesson plan, which is based off of, you know, a say a, a phonics lesson plan, such as letters would advise us to build. And we've just kind of uh, made it super easy for teacher planning in that in each section, you have sort of a list of options. So we kind of go through and just with a highlighter, um, highlight what our acti it's it has saved me a ton of time finally kind of developing it to this stage um, and I'd be willing to share it with you later Pam and you can put it out there because um, it kind of has all the all the pieces and has been really um, kind of slick for planning um, you can't necessarily get to everything in a 30 minute lesson <laughs> that's that's a time management is something that we're still um, still working on really. But um, so yeah, we have a good solid phonics lesson plan that is sort of, this is what we need to cover and making sure they have all the components that 
that you would want to see in a quality um, lesson plan? Well, def I'll definitely put on a, you know me, it'll be on a Padlet. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, and I, of course, we'll share. And thank you, Krista, for sharing. So two last questions. Um, one, for, for all of the Bighorn folks and uh, Heather from YLET, is there anything that wasn't asked from our group that you wish was asked that you want to make sure we know? And then I'll ask the second one after that. Anything that wasn't asked that you think before everyone leaves here in four minutes, uh, you have to know this. Gosh. Um, I think acknowledging, I mean, so when I spoke to your teachers that, that it's, that it is a little bit scary and that they had some, you know, teachers were anxious about parent conversations and how do I handle sort of a fourth grader who we now know needs this backfill, but we missed it. Like, how do we handle those conversations? And, and I think that's, you know, I, I don't know, Crystal, how you had sort of advised teachers to handle those kinds of things. Yeah, I think that's why we kind of tried to um, formalize our thoughts in those, those documents, <laughs> those documents that we, our parent communication, both of those um, parent letters that went out um, just to help us in a way to sort of condense everything into that. Um, but yeah, they're... I wish that I did have a more clear answer as to how and why this group of educators was just willing to embrace and go move forward with this. Because I know that so many teachers out there are in a different situation where they see what they need to be doing and yet they somehow are not able to really follow that, those convictions that they have. So. That's why I was like, I wish I did know exactly how this happened <laughs> for us, that we were all kind of able to turn this big old ship around in, in a matter of, you know, one year. Um, I wish I could tell you more specifically. I think you for did me, know. I'm the type of person that just sees the data and it's like, makes sense. Okay, let's do it. There's no reason to not do that for kids. No, I think you shared lots of things. I mean, um, introducing Emily Hanford's work that's so, you know, it's so accessible and. Mm -hmm. Oh, you muted. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I think you did share a lot. Of, I think you did share a lot with us though about that kind of secret to success um you know you have a leader who's really invested is willing to share mm -hmm. and meet people where they are and you have leadership um that is uh, supporting you and at faculty meetings you know say we're all going to dig into this together and superintendents who are um allowing this to continue and supporting you along the way and you have why lit so you have a lot of things together but i think you can really yeah. tell how committed you're, you all are, um, that once you um, went through some of those stages of grief, and I think I always say that too, I, I'm a national letters trainer, and I always say, I haven't done a letters training yet, where it's, someone isn't going through one of those stages, you know, and I went through them too. It's heartbreaking to find out that, um, you know, you didn't know how to do it, and you weren't taught in college, right, Donna? <laughs> so um, what next? <laughs> I know letters training is next, and honestly, I'd love to have you guys back for an open mic night and, you know, see what happens next, maybe down the road here. And I told them once COVID is, you know, <laughs> gone, yeah. I'm, I'm taking a field trip, yeah, <laughs> Big that one. Awesome. Um, but what next? I know letters, um, but what other things do you want to share with folks before we close up? Well, I think really that's going to be huge. Um, the letters training piece, we, you know, that, that's, that will be huge. Um, I also feel like um, our, our, the other school in our district, I think, is kind of coming on board, and that's super exciting for us to kind of be able to have that collaboration with them. So that will make a big change in the way that we, um, you know, to have our our both of the schools in our district really embracing the science. Um, so I think that um, our partnership with YLIT will bring us some really exciting um, opportunities to sort of be a, a um, 
I don't know, pilot for the state and, and hopefully, uh, you know, I know there's some other schools in our state um, that are coming along also with us. Um, I do think that our, our blissful honeymoon state here that we're in, you know, I don't deny that we'll probably face some opposition as we get a little more, um, you know, press <laughs> from, uh, you know, as, as we, you know, make our partnership with Wylet and all of that, which is so exciting. I mean, that's huge. What school gets that type of opportunity? It's huge. And I feel like yeah, we probably have to prepare ourselves that we may find, um, you know, a little bit of pushback from other districts or, you know, it's not every, not everyone's in the same position that we are. So you've got a lot of cheerleaders here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Many that couldn't be here. And there was a question about whether it was going to be recorded and, and absolutely. So, um, I don't know if you can turn, uh, take your cameras on and just give uh, the Bighorn Elementary team uh, uh, leadership and why let a big rat, like Dr. Jean would say, a big round of applause because <laughs> <laughs> we are so, so grateful to you for taking the time to share your journey with us. Um, you really are uh, rocking the world. There are schools that are using this as a template to have conversations and make a difference for teachers and kids. And that, I mean, that's why I know all of us on this get up every every day to make that difference. So thank you for doing that and sharing your journey with us. I really appreciate it. Um, next month, <laughs> I, I am crazy. Yes, we're gonna do one in December. <laughs> um, just an open mic night. Um, and Susan Hall reached out and said she would love to do an open mic night, which I can't, uh, so exciting too. So um, next month, it's, it's always the third Wednesday of the month. It's gonna be Susan Hall and some school leaders as well. We're gonna kind of stay with this for a few months looking at these um, school districts that are making a difference. Um, it's accelerate, Accelerating Literacy Gains After COVID Tips for Leaders with Dr. Susan Hall on December 16th. So we hope that you can join us. Everybody have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Take a rest and breathe. <laughs> Stay healthy and well and see everybody next month. Thank you again, Bighorn Elementary and Wylet. Really, truly. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pam. Oh my gosh, thank you. I'll be in touch, Crystal. All and right. Have, I just look for that, of course. <laughs> See everybody. All right. All thank right, bye. you so much. Thank you.